Good morning. Today we're continuing our series on Acts, which we picked up again last week when Phil reflected on Philip's encounter with the Ethiopian eunuch. If you were with us in the autumn, you'll remember that we're looking at Acts in chunks over the course of this year, focusing on the key phrase from Acts 1, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Today we're looking at Saul's dramatic conversion on the road to Damascus, which has been described as the most famous conversion in church history. It was a landmark moment in the development of the early church and the spread of Christianity to here, there and everywhere. As Saul, who later became more commonly known as Paul, was to become the apostle to the Gentiles and went on to write a significant amount of the New Testament. Tom Wright puts it like this. If the death and resurrection of Jesus is the hinge on which the great door of history swung open at last, the conversion of Saul of Tarsus was the moment when all the ancient promises of God gathered themselves up, rolled themselves into a ball and came hurtling through that open door and out into the wide world beyond. Saul's conversion was so significant that Luke includes it three times in the book of Acts, once here in chapter 9 as part of his narrative, and twice more in Paul's own speeches in Acts 22 and Acts 26. And the phrase a Damascus Road experience is still used today to describe when someone has a sudden complete turnaround in their views or actions. And there's no doubt that Saul's conversion involved both a significant change of heart and direction, resulting in him, even in the course of the events described in this chapter, going from being the persecutor to the persecuted. When Stephen was stoned to death, Saul was there giving his approval to his death. And following Stephen's death, we read at the beginning of chapter 8 that Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Well, at the start of chapter 9, we heard that Saul was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Not content with tracking down the few disciples who remained in Jerusalem, Saul was now on his way to Damascus to find anyone who belonged to the way there and take them back as prisoners to Jerusalem. Saul hadn't just decided not to follow Christ. He wasn't merely indifferent to his claims. But as a devout Jew and a member of the Pharisees, Saul was a bitter opponent of Jesus and all those who followed him. He was full of hatred and hostility towards the early Christians, or followers of the way as Luke describes them here. By the time he was on his way to Damascus, Saul had gained something of a reputation for being the ringleader of the movement to rid the earth of Christians. He was a proper baddie in the eyes of the early Christians. And we can tell from Ananias' response in verse 13 to the vision he had that Saul's reputation had preceded him to Damascus. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. No one, not Saul, not his fellow Jews, and certainly not the early Christians, would have been expecting what happened next. Surely someone like Saul was beyond reach. Nothing would change his mind. But none of them had factored in God's sovereign grace. God's sovereign grace. And so we read that as Saul was nearing Damascus, God stepped in. Suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul. Why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. In that moment, Saul's whole life and what he believed up to that point to be true was turned upside down because this personal encounter with the resurrected Jesus made Saul realise that Jesus was indeed alive 
and that his claims about himself were true, that the early Christians had got it right, and he, Saul, had got it wrong, and that when he was persecuting these early Christians, he was, in fact, persecuting Jesus himself, the risen Lord. As a result of this encounter, instead of arriving in Damascus, leading the way and full of pride, Saul arrived a changed man, humbled and blinded, led by the hand of one of his companions. He did not eat or drink anything for three days, and it's likely that he spent much of this time in prayer to Jesus. The seemingly impossible had happened. Saul, the chief persecutor of the Christians in Jerusalem and elsewhere, had encountered the risen Jesus for himself. And he, the worst of sinners, as Saul later described himself in his letter to Timothy, had by God's grace been saved. How often today do we judge people as being beyond help? How often do we look at the lives of people we hear about in the news, or even those of people we know, and think that change is impossible? But we need to remember that nothing is impossible with God, and no one is beyond his reach, because no one is excluded from God's love and grace. As Phil reminded us last week, all are out. We are all sinners. But because of Jesus, all can be in. God will save anyone who responds by turning to him when he calls to them. And God still dramatically changes lives today. And he calls those others would have dismissed or written off altogether to serve him. Take Daryl Tunningley, for example. Darrell began his criminal career aged 11. By the time he was 16, he'd developed a £300 a day heroin habit and was later jailed for armed robbery. He says, I wasn't far off being an antichrist. I just didn't care at all. I thought to myself, if I'm going to be bad, I'm going to be the best kind of bad I can possibly be. But all this changed one day when he was in prison. Daryl says, one day, a bloke with a clipboard asked me if I wanted to join the Alpha course. And I basically went because they offered free coffee and biscuits and I wouldn't have to spend my afternoon in my cell. There were two nuns and I gave them a load of abuse, but they were very patient and seemed to listen to what I had to say. They responded with compassion and love. That night, I said the first real prayer I had ever said and told God I needed him to prove it and take away my drug addiction, the violence, the anger, the hate. The next morning, Daryl tried to smoke a cigarette, but it made him feel sick. He went to look in the mirror to wash and didn't recognise himself because his face was beaming and all the hatred and anger had drained from him. He became a different person shunning fights and drugs, and even running a church course in prison. Darrell has since dedicated his life to sharing the love of Christ in the community and around the world by bringing God's hope to those who feel they are unreachable through his work with churches, charities and in education. And he shared his story at conferences, events and churches around the world. Like Saul, Darrell's conversion involved a complete change of heart and direction. And it didn't just impact his own life, but he went on to impact the lives of many others. But Daryl's conversion wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for the willingness of those two nuns to lead an alpha course in prison and the willingness to respond to criminals like Daryl with love and compassion. And Saul's conversion wouldn't have been completed if it wasn't for the willingness of Ananias to respond to Jesus's command to go and visit Saul. Saul needed someone to follow up his conversion experience and bring him into relationship with the church, with other believers, and someone 
needed to be willing to respond to God's call to do that, despite the fierce reputation Saul had. And despite Ananias' initial reluctance, which was quite understandable given Saul's reputation for persecuting believers, he was obedient to the vision he'd received. Interestingly, Ananias didn't enter the house and start questioning Saul about his encounter with Jesus. He simply did as God had prompted him to and placed his hands on Saul to restore his sight. But he went further than that when he addressed Saul as brother. In saying this, Ananias welcomed Saul, who only days before had been feared as persecutor-in-chief of these early Christians, into the family of believers. He welcomed him as family, and he welcomed him by name. Like the Ethiopian eunuch we looked at last week, Saul was then baptised, presumably by Ananias, as a public sign of his conversion and his welcome into the community of believers. Also like the Ethiopian eunuch, Saul was not someone whom Ananias or any of the other early believers would have been expecting to become one of them. No one would have expected that. And I think the example Ananias provides raises some interesting challenges for us. Although this is the only time Ananias is mentioned in the Bible, he has a key role to play in God's plan by visiting Saul, laying his hands on him and baptising him. Ananias helped pave the way for God's message to reach the Gentiles because as the Lord said to him about Saul, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. If Ananias had refused to obey, God would have had to find another way to use someone else and ultimately Ananias would have missed out on being part of God's plan. His actions here demonstrate several things about him that we should both learn from and be challenged by. First, Ananias was a disciple who knew how to listen for the voice of Jesus. He knew how to listen for Jesus' voice. How good are we at listening for the voice of Jesus, at responding to the Spirit's promptings? Do we spend enough time with Jesus to be able to recognise his voice when he does speak to us, even if it's something unexpected or that we don't want to hear? Second, Ananias had the courage to obey Jesus, even though what he was being called to do was potentially dangerous. Yes, he initially questioned it, but he overcame his fear and went as he'd been instructed. How willing are we to take risks for Jesus, to put our trust in him and follow his call, even when it involves us stepping out of our comfort zone and doing something we'd perhaps rather not do? Third, Ananias was willing to welcome into their community someone who hadn't just been an outsider, but was a violent opponent of the early believers, to call him brother and to baptise him. How willing are we to reach out to those we might view as outsiders? To reach out to those who are different from us, remembering and accepting that because of Jesus, all can be in if they respond to God's call to them. By the end of the reading we heard, Saul had had a life-changing encounter with the risen Jesus and been baptised and welcomed into relationship with other believers by Ananias. But the story of his conversion doesn't end there. We need to look at the next bit of the chapter to see what impact it began to have on his life and actions. The proof, so to speak, of his conversion and the start of his radical transformation. In verses 19 to 31, we read how Saul spent time with the disciples in Damascus and at once began to preach in the synagogue that Jesus is the Son of God. What a turnaround for him, the chief persecutor of Christians. It's somewhat ironic that after many days, which we learn from Paul in Galatians, was in fact probably three years, the Jews whose side he had once been on now conspire to kill Saul, so he has to leave Damascus. And despite this, and the incredible change in Saul, it's perhaps not surprising that when he returns to Jerusalem, the disciples there were all afraid of him. 
Remember when he left Jerusalem, he'd been on a mission to destroy the church there. But thankfully Barnabas steps in, who we'll hear more about another week. And he vouches for Saul and the fact that he has really changed. So Saul is able to stay in Jerusalem, to have fellowship with the believers there, and to speak boldly in the name of the Lord, until he once again has to flee, because the Jews there wanted to kill him too. Saul's conversion immediately led him to want to spend time in fellowship with other believers and to witness to others about his newfound faith in Christ. Even in this chapter, we read how he's already preaching fearlessly that Jesus is the Son of God and speaking boldly in his name. But alongside that comes persecution. Saul the persecutor has become Saul the persecuted. There's no doubt that Saul's conversion is genuine and has changed his life dramatically. So what can we learn from this account of Saul's conversion about conversions more generally? Certainly, as I'm sure most of us here can testify, not all conversions are as dramatic as Saul's, and they don't need to be. But there are some common features to most conversions. First, there needs to be a personal encounter with Jesus. We must experience this in some form, though for most of us this will not be as dramatic as Saul's encounter with him, and may simply be more of a gradual realisation of Jesus' presence with us in our lives. Second, there needs to be a surrender to Jesus and repentance. At some point, we need to acknowledge that we are sinners and to ask for God's forgiveness and to surrender our lives to him as our Lord and Saviour. And third, there's normally a call to service, because when we come to faith, we are each called to start serving God in our daily lives, whatever form that might take. And many conversions occur when people are actively seeking after God, like the Ethiopian unit we looked at last week. But Saul's conversion, like Daryl's, reminds us that God can pursue and reach out to people who are not seemingly seeking after him, or who are doing so only reluctantly, who others might dismiss as being beyond God's reach reach beyond redemption. As John Stott puts it, Saul didn't decide for Christ, as we might say. On the contrary, he was persecuting Christ. It was rather Christ who decided for him and intervened in his life. Interestingly, in chapter 26, when Paul recounts his conversion experience in his own words, he includes the fact that Jesus said to him, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. Now, a goad was a long, extremely sharp stick used to get an ox going the way you wanted when ploughing. Apparently, you jabbed the hind legs of the ox with the goad until it eventually cooperated. This suggests that Jesus had in fact been pursuing Saul, prodding and poking him long before his dramatic encounter with the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus, perhaps through Saul's niggling doubts. Maybe through the example of Stephen, his death all had witnessed and and through his conscience. And that it was hard or even futile for Saul to resist him. C.S. Lewis describes his own conversion experience of finally giving in to God's pursuit of him in a similar way. He writes, You must picture me alone in that room at Magdalen, night after night, feeling wherever my mind lifted, even for a second from my work, the steady, unrelenting approach of him whom I earnestly desired not to meet. That which I greatly feared had at last come upon me. In the Trinity term of 1929 I gave in and admitted that God was God and knelt and prayed. Perhaps that night the most dejected and reluctant convert in all of England. But although God actively pursues people He doesn't compel us to turn to him. When Jesus appeared to Saul on the road to Damascus, he began by asking Saul, why do you persecute me? And although he then told Saul what to do next, he didn't force him to obey. As the song we sometimes sing goes, God pursues us, each of us with an overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love, even though none of us have done anything to deserve it. 
as Paul went on to write in his letter to the Ephesians. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. It is God's grace, his gift of grace, which draws us each into relationship with him. But it's up to each of us to respond to him and invite him into our hearts and our lives. And when we do respond to Jesus, this should be evident in a change in the way we live our lives, as it was in Saul's life, as it was in Daryl's life. Our lives cannot continue just as they were before our conversion. There should be evidence of a gradual transformation into Christ's image. Our conversion is not it's just the start of our journey with Jesus. It's not an end point. It should be evident from our lives going forward that something is different as our lives are gradually, often very gradually, and with much stumbling along the way, transformed through the Holy Spirit living in us into Christ's image. And there should be evidence of a change in our relationship with God, the church and the world. As we become disciples of Jesus, we become brothers and sisters within the family of the church and are called to be witnesses to those we meet in the world around us in the course of our daily lives. Jesus, in his grace, met with Saul, the chief of sinners on the road to Damascus, and called him to be his apostle to the Gentiles. This encounter transformed Saul's life, and he spent the rest of his life proclaiming the gospel to all those he met. Despite the suffering and persecution he faced as a result, because he now believed that Jesus was the Son of God. And we, all like Saul, are sinners saved by grace. And Jesus, in his grace, meets with each of us today, sinners as we are, and calls us each to follow him, because he loves us with a love that knows no limits, a love so great that he came to earth to live among us and died on a cross to save us. Amen.